Today is January 18th, 2023. I want to talk about the conflict, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. I want to start by taking a look at liveuamap.com. Keep in mind, this is a pro-Ukrainian map. And if we zoom in, we will notice that, again, the, the front line uh, in Kherson and, and across Zaporozhia, that that is relatively stable. It's stable because Ukraine does not have the means of crossing the Dnieper River. And this is where Russia uh, cr created the new line of contact, shortening it significantly and concentrating its forces along a much shorter line of contact. This is in the advantage of Russia. The, the bulk of the fighting is still around Bakhmut. And when you zoom in, this is Bakhmut. Uh, and if we zoom in to Solodar, just north of Bakhmut, we notice that even according to this pro-Ukrainian map, Russian forces have taken over even more uh, territory around Solodar, including the rail station. And what they have done is they have cut Bakhmut off uh, from Seversk. And so troops and equipment cannot flow either in either direction now. Uh, to or from Bakhmut. This will make uh, Seversk more vulnerable if if the I idea or plan was to ever transfer equipment and men from Bakhmut, which I don't think is a possibility anymore. And we can see the map indicates Russian forces swinging in the south uh, to the northwest. And they are looking at cutting Bakhmut off uh, along these major roads and rail lines. So uh, look at these rifle icons, these red rifle icons. This means there is fighting in this area, but no change in, in territory. Uh, but that means that Russian forces are attempting to cut off all of the main uh, transit routes in and out of Bakhmut. Russian forces don't need to actually arrive at these roads or rail lines if they get just close enough. Um, they can use long-range weaponry to uh, exercise a certain amount of control over it in terms of destroying anything that tries to go uh, along that road in and out of Bakhmut. And so what is happening is uh, encirclement. That is what's happening at Bakhmut. Ukraine, the Ukrainian military is continuously sending more equipment, more men to Bakhmut, and it is all being destroyed by Russian forces. And this, again, this is consistent with Russia's demilitarization objective. They want to demilitarize Ukraine. That is what they're doing. Uh, I, I have said many times they, they do not need to go on the offensive to take up large amounts of territory if the Ukrainian military is going to come to them in this manner. So this is going to continue. We have to keep our eyes on this. Uh, to, to the north of Bakhmut is Kremena. You have to keep an eye on that. That This is the, the line of contact between Ukrainian forces in Kharkov and uh, Russian forces in Lugansk. And this is where the Kharkov offensive ground to a halt. And this is where it has been for months now. The U.S. announced that it was sending a Patriot missile battery to Ukraine. There's already 90 to 100 Ukrainian troops in the United States right now training to use this. I've already talked about the critical missile shortage for the Patriot air defense system. This is worldwide. Everyone operating Patriot missile systems face a missile shortage, especially Saudi Arabia, who has been try at least trying to use them to thwart Yemeni uh, drone and missile strikes. So the U.S. is going to send a battery. Germany announced that it was going to send a battery. And now we have this from the New York Times. Netherlands considers sending Patriot missile system to Ukraine. The Prime Minister of the Netherlands said on Tuesday that his country was considering sending a Patriot missile system to Ukraine, a move that would bolster Kiev's air defenses and help repel Russian strikes. But it won't. It won't. It'll just deplete the very small number of Patriot missiles that remain quicker and whatever the U.S. is able to produce, it'll, uh, it'll expend those much faster. Now, in this New York Times article, they are citing this, this incident where a residential building was partially destroyed, uh, apparently by some type of missile. 
the Western media is claiming without any evidence or explanation, they are claiming that it was a Russian cruise missile. Russia targeted this residential building in uh, Dnipro city. And this is the reason why the Netherlands is now talking about sending a Patriot missile system. And, and now I'm going to get into this. There is a, a unified theme across the Western media discussing the need for significant escalation, what that escalation is. They don't make entirely clear, but I, I think they're preparing to announce something and they are clinging to this residential building being destroyed as a pretext. And we, had, we have seen the US and its allies do this over and over again in Syria from 2011 onward. Uh, every time they sought to escalate militarily, they would sometimes fabricate or stage an incident or they would uh, take an incident that happened and distort it to use as some sort of pretext. And every time Russia successfully managed the conflict and avoided uh, escalation from going out of control because the US did did use some of these incidents as a as a pretext to launch cruise missile strikes across Syria um, they cite it as a reason to maintain their illegal occupation of eastern Syria and so something very similar is is in the works for Ukraine we have to be on the lookout for that now in addition to Ukraine losing territory in and around Bakhmut uh, and the situation looking very bleak there. And in addition to Russia systematically dismantling Ukraine's power grid, every, every wave of missile strikes uh, diminishes it even further. There have been some losses in, in the senior ranks of the Ukrainian government. So uh, the first one is this article from... The BBC, Ukraine war, Zelensky advisor resigns over Dnipro remarks. It says Ukrainian presidential advisor Alexei Aristovich has offered his resignation after suggesting a Russian missile which hit a building in Dnipro killing 44 people was shot down by Kiev. Mr. Aristovich apologized and said he had made a fundamental error. The original remark caused widespread anger in his country and was used by Russian officials to blame Ukraine. The advisor is well a well-known figure because of his daily updates on YouTube watched by millions. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has not yet commented on Aristovich's decision to resign. There may have been an update uh, regarding this story. This was uh, as the, at the time of recording, 18 hours ago. And if, if there has been a further development, just uh, put it in the comment section and try to cite some sort of source. Uh, the only mistake Aristovich made was giving a rational explanation to what happened. Uh, there was widespread anger in the country, not based on any sort of evidence, but based on the necessity that Ukraine has for blaming this on Russia, no matter who actually was responsible. Now, we know for a fact that Ukrainian air defense systems have wreaked almost as much damage on, on residential areas as Russian cruise missiles have on Ukrainian infrastructure. And there, there was also a incident where a Ukrainian air defense missile landed in Poland and killed two Polish civilians. And another missile landed in Belarus. And these are accidents. It's not as if Ukraine is deliberately doing this, but it is what is happening because of the way they are trying to defend against uh, Russian cruise missiles. So Aristovich is, is providing the only actually rational explanation for what happened in, in Dnipro regarding this residential building. Everyone else is simply suggesting Russia, simply because it is evil, deliberately targeted this residential building, ran, randomly targeted it and, and killed these people for no other reason than because Russia is pure evil, even though the Western media themselves admit that there is an ongoing missile campaign to target infrastructure, not, not civilian residential complexes. And just to give you an idea of how this is being used, this residential building being hit, uh, I've seen a, a large number of articles now uh, that, that New York Times article cited 
the the residential building being hit there's this from cnn biden reaches a vital new tipping point on ukraine that you know that sounds very serious and the article says the west has reached its latest fateful crossroads over ukraine looming decisions on deepening support for kiev's fight against russia russian president vladimir putin's onslaught have been rendered even more critical by a winter battlefield that was more dynamic than the expected frozen stalemate uh, they're talking about ukraine losing cities is what they're talking about Time is also fast ebbing for the U.S. and its allies to send more powerful weapons and to train Ukrainian soldiers how to use them before the second possibly decisive year of the war, which could see Russia launch a ferocious new offensive. The humanitarian cost of the conflict and the justification for Western aid was, meanwhile, laid bare by the horror of a Russian cruise missile attack on a nine-story apartment block in Dnipro in central Ukraine that killed 45 people, including six children. Never forget to mention the children when you're trying to use a tragedy as a pretext to escalate violence. The tragedy exacerbated the depravity of an, an unprovoked war and renewed calls for Putin to face war crime charges. It also underscored that any hopes for a negotiated end to the war are more distant than ever, a fact that seems to have injected new resolve and unity in the Western alliance at a critical moment. So uh, many people following this conflict uh, Alex Christoforo and Alexander Mikuris of the Duran especially, uh, they said that they're going to push every button necessary to coerce all of Europe, all of NATO into uh, another round of huge military support for Ukraine, emptying out their inventories and has transferring it over to Ukraine. And they are using, cynically using this apartment building tragedy to do it. And this was most likely Ukrainian actions that caused this. Get, getting back to the point, Aristovich, he is out for, for whatever reason, he was in the middle of this narrative that they were trying to use as a pretext. He was undermining it. And now he is paying the price for that. He is gone. So that is one senior advisor gone. And then there is this article from, uh, also from the BBC. Ukraine war. Who was Interior Minister Denis Manastroitsky? Uh, and who was he? Because he died in a, in a helicopter crash. Uh, the article says uh, he died aged 42 in a helicopter crash near Kiev. He is the most senior Ukrainian official to die since the war began almost a year ago, an interior minister is in charge of all of the police internal security of Ukraine. So that's two high level men gone one way or the other, Erstovich resigning and the interior minister perishing in a helicopter crash. So you have uh, tragedy upon tragedy upon setback upon setback. This is where Ukraine is right now. They're losing high-level advisors and ministers. They're losing cities, Solidar, to Russian forces. They're losing Bakhmut to Russian forces. And uh, they're losing huge amounts of men and equipment in the process. They're not simply retreating and losing territory. They are losing men and equipment in the process. And all along, Russia is targeting the power grid and wearing that down. Uh, so this growing pressure, things are going to start to break. And no amount of Western aid sent to Ukraine is going to reverse this. And this is what we see the Western media admitting. This is from the Atlantic. Western aid to Ukraine is still not enough. This is by Elliot Cohen. That name sounds familiar. And this is what he says. Ukraine's friends have poured a considerable amount of weaponry into the nation's fight for survival. That is simply not true. Uh, Ukraine is a proxy of the US. It is fighting for NATO's ability to menace Russia right on its own border. Before 2014, Ukraine was surviving. There was no prospect 
of war with Russia. This is NATO using Ukraine as a proxy. The United States alone has provided more than 25 billion uh, of materiel, including 160 modern artillery pieces, 38 medium range HIMARS rocket systems. Uh, I think he's, I think he's throwing in HIMARS launchers that were promised but have not been delivered yet because uh, these would be ones coming off of assembly lines. Hundreds of armored vehicles and tens of thousands of advanced munitions of all types. Allies such as Poland and the Czech Republic have done even more in relative, not absolute terms, supplying hundreds of Soviet model tanks, an array of modern artillery systems, and all kinds of non-lethal support. Even hesitant, Germany has sent a score of advanced guns and missile launchers, some anti-aircraft systems, and more. In total, the West has sent more than 320 tanks, 2,400 other armored vehicles, 450 artillery pieces, and more than 135 air defense systems to Ukraine, and more is on the way. And all of that, plus the more that's on its way, does not even equal what Ukraine started out with in late February 2022. And then Cohen tries to argue that all of this is what has allowed Ukraine to take back Kharkov and Kherson. But they traded all, all of this equipment that he just listed. They traded all of that in to take back Kharkov for the offensive to grind to a halt uh, at the edge of Lugansk and to take but be unable to administer Kherson city and then be stopped at the Dnieper River. If you believe trading all of that in for those advances and then being weaker uh, after the offensives, if you think all of that was worth it, okay. And of course, all of this is not enough. So this is what he says. This is still not enough. Ukraine needs not only greater quantities, but also different types of arms, including modern battle tanks, extensive air and anti-ballistic missile defenses, and above all, deep attack systems such as the Army Tactical Missile System, ATACMS, and long-range unmanned aerial vehicles. And uh, so people like Cohen, they went from claiming that Ukraine is on the offensive, and here they are back to begging for more weapons to be sent to Ukraine. Um, sending them these long-range missiles, ATACMS, I've already explained this. Yes, it will allow Ukraine to hit targets uh, further behind the, the line of contact. That is true. But Russia has the Iskander missile system. It fires uh, very accurate missiles, very similar to ATACMS. They have a longer range. They have more of them, and they can continuously produce more of them as this conflict goes on. So uh, the ATACMS is only going to give Ukraine a, a slightly inferior ability to do what Russia is already doing and has been doing this entire time. Uh, so if this is a capability that will allow Ukraine to win the war, Russia will win the war first. It's the exact same story with the HIMARS, the M777. I mean, they're talking about uh, 450 artillery pieces. Ukraine started with almost 2,000 artillery pieces. That, that's what they started out with in late February 2022. Uh, the West collectively has only sent 450 more. That this is a huge problem. They cannot, they cannot even restore uh, Ukrainian military capabilities that existed at the end of February last year. He talks about long-range unmanned aerial vehicles. Ukraine had them. They had the Bayraktar TB2, which is a very capable system. It is not, uh, uh, it is not a bad system. It's just incapable of flying into the most advanced air defense systems in the world. That's not even what they're designed to do. And so any other type of long-range unmanned aerial vehicle transferred over to Ukraine is, is going to suffer a similar fate. And if you read this entire piece by Cohen, you will see him resort to all of these uh, fabricated claims, baseless claims about Russia losing 100,000 troops. Uh, so Cohen is repeating, reciting all of these uh, ridiculous narratives. And you just have to wonder how much of this is Cohen uh, using propaganda to keep the arms flowing because he has connections to these think tanks that are funded by arms manufacturers. 
How much of it is pure propaganda and how much of it is just ignorance? Cohen and many others in the West having no idea how any of this actually works in reality. It's very hard to tell sometimes. Now, I talked about this residential building in Dnipro being hit and how the West is trying to use this as a pretext to announce some sort of escalation. Uh, I just want to point this out. This is happening this Friday. Uh, Secretary of Defense, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, travel to Germany for Ukraine Defense Contact Group meetings. Uh, they are doing this on January 20th, Friday, this coming Friday. And this is the monthly meeting. And this is where they all pledge upcoming military aid they will be giving to Ukraine. So I think they have something that they're going to announce or, you know, something big that they're going to announce or at least something they think is big that they're going to announce. I highly suspect it's going to be that Germany agrees to sending Leopard 2 tanks in large numbers. And I've heard the West is preparing to send up to 100. Let's just say it's 300 or even 500 tanks. Uh, just think about all of the problems you're going to have just transferring them to Ukraine physically, training Ukrainians to operate them in any timely manner and, and for them to be able to operate them effectively and the logistical nightmare of trying to fuel, arm, and maintain hundreds of main battle tanks that Ukraine previously had no experience operating, tanks that are going... Tanks that weigh uh, many tons and that will have to be shipped a thousand kilometers away from the front line to Poland to be serviced, and then another thousand kilometers back to the front line. Just imagine uh, the nightmare this poses for Ukrainian forces, hardly giving them a capability they didn't have before. They're actually going to be more cumbersome now than they were at the end of February 2022. But they're going to make this announcement on Friday. Uh, they're going to be transferring all of this equipment to Ukraine. It's just a matter of how much and what they're going to be giving them. And the hope is either use it on the defensive, which I think would be the smartest thing to do, or to go on the offensive with it. And if you go on the offensive with this equipment, the exact same thing that happened at Kherson and Kharkov is going to happen again only it's going to be Western main battle tanks being destroyed rather than Soviet era Polish tanks transferred to Ukraine being destroyed. Russia was able to do that then. And since then, they have mobilized 300,000 additional troops. They're bringing in their own uh, increasingly large numbers of heavy equipment tanks, main battle tanks of their own. They have constructed these massive defensive lines with tank traps, uh, ditches, trenches, and fortifications of all kinds specifically to grind a, any sort of offensive to a halt. And I've done videos about how that works, how a lot of these obstacles are designed to channel armor into a kill zone or keep it out in the line of fire longer than if they were just allowed to advance over an open field. And uh, this is what is going to give Russia the ability to stop any of these armored advances. And we can see the unified theme across the Western media and among Western politicians, this upcoming escalation that they have in mind. We just have to wait and see what it is. Um, we will know the results of this meeting in Germany uh, announcing additional military aid for Ukraine. Uh, we'll know, you know, between Friday and Monday, we will know the details of that meeting, and then I will break it down sometime next week. That does it for this update. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing to my channel. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. In the video description below, you will find all the other places you can find and follow my work. I'm on Telegram, I'm on Twitter. Uh, YouTube videos are automatically uploaded on Rumble and Odyssey. It might take a day or two. Subtitles from my YouTube videos will take a day or two. They're auto-generated, but sometimes it takes a little time for them to show up. Uh, in the video description below will be all of the links that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I don't monetize my YouTube channel. 
if you see ads popping up, feel free to block them or skip them because they're not doing me any good. If you do want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also Patreon. And to everyone who has been helping out, whether it's a one-time donation, month-to-month -month donations, or even if you're just sharing my work with others, sending me news tips by email or uh, providing kind comments in the comment section below, I greatly appreciate all of that support. All of it helps me continue doing what I'm doing here. So thank you for that. And as always, thank you for watching.